Hey, hey, what's up, guys? It's Jordan with the Laundromat Resource Podcast. This is show number 57. And I am pumped that you're here today because today is actually a pretty cool episode. I uh, I released an episode a couple of weeks ago, show 55. If you haven't listened to it yet, it's uh, you know it's an interesting one that has generated a lot of buzz, especially on the forums. Um, you might want to jump into that conversation. But basically, we're talking about big data in in show 55. And I got an email from William Ro- Rogerson, and he said he basically had done a presentation on big data and laundromats and sent me his his slideshow and uh, I checked it out. It was very, very interesting. And it was a lot of what I had been talking about and I hadn't heard anybody else talking about it. So it was very cool. So I said, I got to talk to this guy. He's a relatively new laundromat owner. And uh, we talk about his laundromat in today's episode, but we also dig into uh, what kind of data should we be using and what kind of techniques or how, how should we be analyzing it and then helping uh, having that uh, data analysis help us make better decisions for our business. Um, I think it's uh, something that I definitely can grow from. Hopefully, there's a lot of stuff in here that can help you grow in your business and how you make business decisions also. I think there will be for just about everybody. Um, he's it's a cool episode, really cool episode. Um, so make sure you check it out. I am going to get to that in a second though. I just want to say, first of all, a lot of awesome conversations happening, uh, on the forums as always that big data conversation is still happening from show 55. Um, very cool to get some input from a lot of different people on that. So go jump in on that uh, conversation. I will put the link directly to that specific forum post if you want to go check it out in the show notes or in the description on YouTube. Uh, the show notes with the links for you know this link and every other link from the episode, which there'll be quite a few actually in today's episode. Uh, those will be at laundromatresource.com slash show 57. Uh, so make sure you check that out and get connected with all the different resources and tools and tutorials and all kinds of good stuff from today's episode. Um, so make sure you check that out. Uh, but there's also a lot of other really awesome conversations. I, I saw some conversations about building from the ground up. How do you analyze a laundromat if there's no, uh, there's no data at all? Um, no income or expense data. Um, what do you what do you do with that? Can you value it? Is it worth anything? Uh, very interesting conversation. Different opinions about that. So a lot of cool conversations going on and continuing. Still blows my mind. This is my favorite part of the whole forum. Is that there are a lot of you guys connecting with each other, specifically connecting locally which has been an unexpected surprise for me. So make sure you head over there to the new member introductions, introduce yourself, let people know who you are, where you're at on your laundromat journey and where you're at in the world, because there's other people probably not too far from you who have some of the same goals and you guys might be able to connect up with each other, help each other succeed. And I always say that we are better when we work together and we can do that in this industry and pretty much any other industry, but especially this industry, which is the best industry out there, obviously. Uh, so head over to the forums, laundromatresource.com slash forums, ask a question, answer a question, jump in on some conversations, meet some people and just continue, continue, continue to push on uh, growing yourself and growing your businesses. Um, and let's make our way towards that financial freedom through laundromat ownership. That's what we're all about here. All right. Well, I want to jump into it with William here in a second. We got a quick word from our sponsors, a word about our sponsor, which is an awesome sponsor today. Um, and uh, if you haven't utilized their services, you're going to need to do that. And they're, in fact, I'm going to give you a, a promo code to make it entirely and completely free for you. So make sure you uh, jot down notes about this little sponsorship. Uh, that we got going on here. Um, And then we're going to jump into it with William. So let's do this thing. Guys, today's episode is brought to you by Atmosphere TV. You may remember back in episode 34, when Atmosphere TV's Mike Kelly joined me on the podcast. It was an epic, epic episode. If you haven't listened to it, show 34, laundromatresource.com slash show 34. Go check it out. It's incredible. A ton of value there. One of the things we talked about is just the importance of creating a good, positive, atmosphere in your laundromat. And I was just rereading the book by Simon Sinek, Start 
start with why. And one of the things that really stands out to me is that people don't make purchase decisions based on, you know, the logic of, you know, any decision that they're making to spend their money. It's more based on a feeling and an association. And so it's really important to, uh, create a positive feeling, a positive atmosphere, no pun intended, uh, in your laundromat to help people associate this chore that most people don't like doing with something positive. Atmosphere TV is an incredible way to help improve the atmosphere of your laundromat. And basically, if you haven't heard of it, what it is, is it has 50 plus channels uh, created specifically for businesses with everything from uh, sports clips, hilarious fail videos, draw dropping videos from all over the world. There's automobile channels. Uh, there's a ton of stuff. My kids love, love, love it. And my customers love it. Atmosphere TV could be a great way to either supplement your cable or a lot of us laundromat owners are cutting our cable bill completely and running Atmosphere TV. They're designed to be used with no audio, but they also do have an audio option. That way you can kind of design the atmosphere of your laundromat the way that you want it. So get rid of cable, get rid of those news channels that are bringing negativity into your laundromat and fill your laundromat with positive videos that bring positive vibes to your customers with Atmosphere TV. And if you use the code word, the keyword, the uh, promo code, I don't know, resource, promo code resource, then they're going to waive your setup fee. And now everything is going to be free. There's no monthly fee for it. You can use it for free in your laundromat and it's going to bring a positive vibe to your uh, atmosphere. So check out atmosphere.tv. I'll put a link down in the description on YouTube or in the show notes. Check it out there. Make sure you use the keyword resource. That way you can get that thing for free. And Or if you'd like, email Mike at mike.kelly at atmosphere.tv. All right, let's jump into it with William Rogerson and talk about his laundromat experience up to this point. And also let's talk about data and how we can use data to better our business decisions. William, thank you for coming on the show, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh man, it is my honor and pleasure. I am super excited uh, because the way that we got introduced is... I did an episode, a couple of, you know, a few episodes, I think number 55, where I was talking about big data in the laundromat industry and how nobody's really talking about it. And you sent me an email saying that you actually did a presentation on it and sent me the slide deck to your presentation, right? Uh, and I was like, I got to talk to this guy some more. So here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you were, uh, it was like you're reading my mail or something. It was, uh, it was really kind of spot on exactly what I'd been talking about. Um, you know, specifically for the laundromat industry. So um, once I heard that episode, I felt like I, I kind of had to reach out and, and maybe we could chat a little bit more about it. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a team of hackers that hacks into people's <laughs> accounts and stuff. So I figure that's that what happened. Yeah. I mean, we're massive over here. Uh, with our, <laughs> with our hackers. Uh, no, but super cool because I, I seriously was like, whoa, this is crazy. I have not really heard anybody talking about this at all. And here you are already having a presentation together. So I do want to get into that a little bit and, and, you know, data in the laundromat industry and how we can utilize that, especially as, you know, mom and pop type owners where, you know, maybe we own one, two, five, 10, 20, 30, whatever. Um, but how we can utilize data to help us make better decisions in the industry. But before we get into that, who are you? And tell us a little bit about your background. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm William. Um, yeah, I'm uh, originally from Indiana, live in Phoenix currently. Um, grew up in a small town, Southern Indiana. Um, I'm sure we got a lot of people from Hartsville, Indiana listening to this right now. Uh, it's, um, it's town of three, bustling, yeah, bustling town of 300 people. So shout out yeah. to my Hartsvillians. There's one um, person there that does not listen to it. Is it you? Be honest. <laughs> Uh, actually, if someone there is listening, they're probably going to be blown away that Hartsville just got a call out. So, <laughs> <laughs> not, not a sustainable laundromat market there, though. So, I'm, I'm not right, sure yeah. what they're doing. Um, Good point. But, but yeah, uh, so growing up out there, I was, uh, um, you know, kind of relevant to to this conversation. Two things I was always into was, 
you know, taking things apart, figuring out how things worked. Um, I used to kind of take apart computers, rebuild them. I was always very interested in just like learning how, you know, how things operated, just kind of just, I guess, intellectually curious uh, growing up. And um, the other part of that was I was uh, kind of a serial entrepreneur as a kid. So nothing, nothing uh, really of note, but, you know, I would, uh, you know, I think one of my mom's memories she always likes to share is when I was like nine years old, I would go out and catch night crawlers. Um, and then I had a flyer up at the gas station in town and I'd have like random people walking in our backyard to, to buy night crawlers, <laughs> like strangers. And she's like, what the, what are these people doing in our yard? And uh, you know, I'd, I'd be, I just had my little night crawler business going and, you know, we would pick cherries in the summer, go door to door, sell those. Um, you know, I would, you know, I was a kid who sold candy at school to try and make a, a couple extra bucks. Um, you know, in high school, we would go diving at the golf course for golf balls, sell them across the street yes. from the, uh, from the golf, you know, uh, golf club. And so, you know, I was, I always had something, you know, something brewing, some kind of idea. And that's kind of been, you know, a consistent theme for me. Um, we, yeah, and then, you know, after, you know, that was kind of up until college, I went to college, went to, got my undergraduate degree in anthropology. You know, I thought I was going to be out you know, the, somewhere in, you know, some living with some tribe, you know, doing something or the other. I had, I had no intent on going into business or anything like that, but, um, graduated in 2008 with an anthropology degree, then financial crisis hits. Nobody's banging down my door for Ooh, jobs or <laughs> that was a rough time to graduate, man. <laughs> yeah. Time. Yeah. It was, it was not perfect. Um, <laughs> but, but no, so I, I ended up getting a job in you know, kind of the financial world. Um, out of curiosity real quick, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. did those remote tribes get hit hard in 2008 also? You know what? I think they did okay. I think they okay. weathered the crisis a little better than uh, than some of the people in like Manhattan. And yeah. Places, okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I ended up going. Uh, you know, starting this like kind of unexpected career in in business, and uh, you know, ended up getting you know working in underwriting, and I'm really enjoying that. And so one of the things I wanted to do to um, you know, kind of, you know, span my skill set because I had no skill set was, you know, I went back to school, just started taking like night classes, like, Hey, I want to, I want to learn, you know, uh, computer science. I want to learn, um, analytics. I want to learn all these different, like some, some hard skills. And I took a course in, um, in, uh, Excel, which, you know, just Excel and Microsoft access, which completely changed my life because I was, you know, I knew a one plus B one equals, you know, whatever yeah. I could do that. <laughs> that was the extent of my Excel knowledge at the time. Um, and then, you know, all these different like functions and stuff. I was like, Oh man, it's, uh, you can do absolutely anything in here. And, um, you know, at that, that point, like that was cause kind of where my career started shifting and, um, mm. you know, I kind of, uh, slowly moved more into like analytics type roles, um, like, uh, to the point where today, you know, I'm, my role is kind of like data engineering. I kind of build the backend databases and structure so that it's usable for the, the front end users to be able to, you know, uh, you know, get the data that they, they need to make decisions for the business. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, um, kind of my background, but then, you know, that, that experience in both like customer service, as well as, you know, data and, and operations, um, you know, I kind of gotten to the point where I felt like, Hey, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of in the right place now to, to venture out on my own and really do, do something different. And, um, you know, I had a lunch with a friend who, where laundromats came up and that kind of, um, it was well, actually his idea. And I was like, oh, that's a really good idea. I think I'm on gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Does your friend own any laundromats right now? No, actually he doesn't. And so my, my, Got my him. wife, uh, was <laughs> like, is he, is he getting mad at you that, you know, he, that you, I, you took the laundromat idea. And I, I was like, lose. I was like, I don't think so, but let me check. And he's like, Oh no, I love it. Because if, you know, if it does great, you prove my theory and, uh, and I didn't have to take any risks. So that's awesome. <laughs> and it, you know, I feel like on the other side, I'm like, well, great. If I, if I fail, I can blame you, yeah. then, <laughs> but if it's great, then I'll, you know, I take all the credit. So it's, you know, win-win for everybody. Everybody yeah. involved. 
<laughs> <laughs> I can tell that's a great friendship right there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll have to, uh, you'll have to charge him a consulting fee if it does really well for you and he wants in and wants to yeah. buy his own. You'll have to charge yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So you had this lunch with your buddy and then when was it? When did you have this lunch? It was probably, I think it was like my first lunch of the pandemic. So like, it was like mm. probably in like July or August or something. Like we, had, we went out and had a, um, had lunch and we we're just chatting on, you know, we, we, we were a couple of buddies who like to kind of chat business and stuff and just talking about ideas. And, um, Hey, he can't, he said that. And then I was like, it's like, that's, that's a really good idea. I was like, that uh, I've never, yeah. never thought about laundromats before, but I was like, yeah, it's, you know, it's low maintenance. It's something you can kind of do on this. You know, you don't have to be a full-time, full-time engaged with it. Something I could probably do with my, my current career as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I, you know, I, with my background, you know, I came from, uh, I worked at a company called Carvana before. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's, that's kind of a similar structure. And that was like a lot of mom and top dealer dealerships, very fragmented, not a lot of, no one had a lot of market share. Um, but they came in with this idea where like they improved the customer experience. Um, they use analytics. They were able to kind of capture economies of scale by being able to provide cars, um, you know, centralize, you know, centralize all their cars, but be able to provide those to, you know, that same car to people in hundreds of different markets. Um, and so, you know, now you can't necessarily do that with laundromats, but, um, what you can do is, you know, you can, you know, if in a fragmented market, you can, you know, gain a lot of market share. Um, and, you know, analytics, you know, is kind of, um, can kind of provide the necessary tailwind, um, to, to gain that market share, I think, because, Historically, I don't think you get a lot of benefit from owning a lot of laundromats. Like, you don't, you can't really go with the utility, you know, the utility companies and say, "Hey, like, do you mind me cutting me a deal on this water because I'm I'm using a lot of it." Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. You don't really get like the benefit of you know that you would from like suppliers and stuff. Now you might with like, um, you know, you might with uh, maybe the dealers for you know Dexter or whatever you might be able to get mm-hmm. a little better deals maybe you're a little better at negotiating rent or something but um it, it didn't quite have the same you don't really quite get the same benefits of scale that you do in other industries but um with analytics if you can actually implement it correctly those those benefits could actually um start providing you some some real benefit at scale yeah so that was kind of where my that was the the dots that started getting connected when when i when I had that lunch and I was like, oh okay well let me let me re- read more into this and then I was kind of like, oh well, you know everything I'm reading says you know the success rate is very high for these things um they generally have a very high r o i like it's you know it, it just uh it's like well i i don't I can't see the downside here, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, just quick side note that those statistics about how high the success rate is makes you feel real bad when you're failing in your first <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. Well, I've heard, I've, I've heard you tell the story about your, your first <laughs> one and uh, that kind of stuck. I was like, you know, cause mine's in kind of a questionable neighborhood as well. I was like, man, I, I hope there's not a gang in there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it's a great number until you're on the other end of that small minority of failures. And, uh, um, anyways, yeah. So, oh, that's interesting. Okay. So you, so you have this lunch with your buddy and your mind starts going about, you know, pulling in all from all your experience that you've had here and you're, and you start thinking about, you know, how, how basically how you can use data, you know, and I like your point about how there's not really a whole lot of economies of scale. I think you can get some discount, you know, from equipment, but even, even rent stuff, it's not like, unless you're in an area where one company owns a ton of uh, real estate, you know, you're really not getting any benefit because you're probably working with multiple landlords. And so Mm -hmm. really, you know, equipment is your, is your one thing. If you have a lot of, um, you know, like a lot of laundromats, you're really not getting a lot, but I do like the fact that if you do have multiple laundromats, you're getting more data and you can leverage that data to your advantage to help you make decisions. So I like that. That's pretty interesting. Um, okay. So you started doing some research. You like, 
you know, the high ROI, the high rate of success. Uh, so what, what did you do from there? Um, you know, I just honestly went and did laundry at a bunch of laundromats. <laughs> just, <laughs> just started going in and I'm um, just trying to get a feel for it. Like, Hey, is this, you know, is this something I'd be even interested in? And, you know, we went in one and probably about a month after that lunch, uh, me and my friend actually, cause we were still at that point kind of thinking it's going in as partners. And so we went in and just kind of sat in there. The idea? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, we went in there and I was like, uh, you know, it was, it was in, uh, in Tempe right next to the university. It was a lot of, um, um, a lot of kind of vagrants and people that would go in there and cause like, you know, it was 24 hours and they would, you know, you know, the, the attendant was very upfront with what was happening there. <laughs> like she just, you know, she did not, she did not sugarcoat it one bit. And so, <laughs> which is probably what I needed here as well at that point, like, Hey, this is kind of the reality of the situation to a degree for some of these places yeah. um, that, you know, it's, it's not always, you know, <laughs> not all the glitz and glamor that people think the, uh, you know, when they think of the laundromat industry. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Glamorous <laughs> is the word that comes to mind when you think of laundromats. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, but, um, but yeah, so we were in there and then, um, it, that one ended up being for like the first one we went into, like ended up being for sale. Um, and we just found that out because we were in there, you know, talking oh. to her and we told her that we were looking to buy one and we were just, you know, kind of do some research and, um, we didn't end up really, um, like, I think my friend was a little spooked by, you know, some of the stuff she was saying. So, <laughs> you know, we kind of went separate directions on that. And, um, and then the, you know, I was like, it's kind of far away. Um, you know, it doesn't like, I don't really feel like I wanted to kind of handle all these problems that are, um, being presented. Um, so I kept kind of just keeping my eye on the, um, what is the biz buy sell stuff and just kind mm -hmm. of watching as new stuff came through. And I went and I went and visited a couple more, um, but you know, they were just, I don't know, so just honestly, at that point, it was more of a feel thing. Like this just doesn't feel like feel quite right. Um, then the last one I, um, I saw, I went in, you know, it's in, it's in a, a big parking lot with a, with a, um, grocery store. It's got a lot of foot traffic. I walked in there. It was super busy. Um, it was, it was a bit run down, but you know, it was something like, you know, I could tell it was just needed some elbow grease first, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of repairs. Um, so I started the process and started looking into it. The numbers were great. Um, you know, everything on paper looked fantastic. So I just, you know, I, I moved, honestly moved pretty quickly and had an offer in within like two days, um, from the time I actually looked at it. Dang. So you found that one on online too? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, okay. I had a great broker who I I'm actually still in touch with. Um, nice. and you know, I hear, I hear that a lot on your show, like find a good broker. Mm -hmm. Um, there's really, I'm like, hopefully they don't listen to this, but <laughs> there's really two big ones in, in Phoenix that I've, I've dealt with. And, you know, one guy, he's real old school and he's just, you know, he's a sales guy through and through. Like he's yeah. just, that's what he does. He, he sells on a And ironically enough, he actually um, started the one that I own in the oh. early nineties. And so I, I was looking, cause I was looking at a second location and we had a conversation, but, um, you know, he, he's very much a salesman. Um, the other one is very much like, you know, he's, he wants to help you and he mm -hmm. wants to give you the lay land. He wants to give you all the hint, the tips <clears throat> and he wants to, and, you know, I had someone that really, really helped me through that process, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful for, because I, I mean, I think I could have really got my, ass handed to me, <laughs> but I would, uh, would have, uh, I'm sorry for the language. I'm not sure for, <laughs> um, but yeah, I uh, got my butt handed to me if I had not been, um, you know, had him with me because he, he really did a great job for me. Yeah. 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 I, and I always say, man, it's important to have somebody there because you can, you know, go awry pretty quickly if you, if you, don't know what you're doing and somebody's out there trying to take advantage of you or trying to deceive you or something like that, or you just are making bad decisions. Uh, okay. So you, you found this laundromat online, you pretty quickly made an assessment about how it was 
performing and decided that you liked it. So you made an offer on it. What was the process like going through after you made the offer? Was there negotiations? Did they just accept it? What was that all like? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I just went in a little under a little, a little under asking price. Um, yeah, we ended up meeting, meeting somewhere in the middle. Um, but, uh, but yeah, then, I mean, honestly, it was just really doing due diligence at that point. So just going in, verifying, you know, I got all the, all the statements for everything, um, went through the lease agreement, uh, made sure that everything made sense with that. Um, made sure there was nothing like, nothing hinky in the details that, you know, might come and bite me, um, in the butt later, um, Mm -hmm. did the collections, which, I mean, that was the point, you know, the part that I'm really concerned about. I was like, I can make everything else probably work, but if I'm not like, if the money's not where it's supposed to be, that's going to be, um, be a huge issue. Um, now I will say like, I, you know, one of the things I came in this to, like, I, I really am, was super interested in the, business for the sake of business. I, I was not like, I have to make money. Like I have to do this. Like I, I'm genuinely interested in like the, the laundromat business model. I wanted to learn more about it. So I was like, I had, I had a pretty low threshold, like, Hey, like this is making way more money than if, if, if it makes this much, that's going to be fantastic. But I, I, I even made out mapped out worst case scenarios, you know, looking at all the, the bills and like, Hey, if, you know, or the, uh, utility bills, like kind of scaling what the current, um, income was to like, okay, if it goes down this much, will I still be fine? And I was like, I can, I can envision a worst case scenario where I wouldn't be, um, be okay with my decision. So, um, based on that, you know, I, I, and, you know, continuing to see like, Hey, every time I go in here, this place is humming. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, you know, it just, it just, everything just continued to feel right. Had someone come in look at the, um, all the equipment, uh, make sure that the equipment was in good condition before I bought it. Um, and the guys that had been, um, that looked at it were actually ones that had been servicing it for like 20 years. So they, they knew the equipment inside and out. Um, Funnily enough, that didn't work out as well as I thought it was going to, but <laughs> <laughs> like the equipment wasn't in as good a shape or what? Well, yeah, you know, they, they came in and said everything, you know, you, you might get burned on something, but you're not going to get burned on the equipment. I'm like, okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's good to know. And then like, you know, they're coming in to fix stuff like, oh yeah, this equipment's got, got some issues. It's older. And, you know, looks like this serial number has been peeled off. Uh, it's going to be hard to get parts for that. I'm like, I asked you guys to do a full look. <laughs> what, 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 are we just gonna pretend like that conversation didn't happen? <laughs> so it's you know it's it's little stuff though. It's nothing. It, like it's just you know little repairs and stuff. It's not nothing that's gonna break the bank. I mean, yeah. um, but you know it, it's just it's more just kind of funny. Like okay, well now I know. Like maybe get a someone that hasn't, you know, that hasn't been working on it to look at it so that they actually do a (laughs) thorough, more thorough job. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And you also got to keep in mind, like it's beneficial for these guys to, you know, I mean, they make their money when they fix stuff. So yeah, they've got some (laughs) some skin in that game. So yeah. Yeah. It's like everything else in, in business in general, like you just, you got to, you know, take it for what it's worth and and recognize where everybody's motivation is coming from. Not that anybody's necessarily trying to deceive you or anything like that, but you know, there are different motivations and, you know, it's nice to just be aware of those and where potential issues could arise. So yeah. Sorry. Sorry. You got a little bit burned on the machines. Hopefully it's not too bad. Yeah. And I, I, I attribute, I don't attribute it to malice. I attribute it to more like they just didn't take the time to really double yeah. check a lot of stuff that maybe they should have. And you know, that's, I, I don't, uh, I hold no grudge. So yeah, <laughs> well, this is a good time for me to put in a quick plug for you and anyone else listening who has a laundromat. I have a free download sheet that has equipment, uh, information. So it'll have, <clears throat> you know, you can put the brand name and there's a spot for like model number, serial number, all that stuff. And I always give that to the mechanic during the inspection and say, Hey, while you're looking through all the equipment, do you mind filling this sheet out? Um, you know, so it'll be like 20 pound speed queen model number, whatever serial number, whatever age or whatever the information that you want to have on there. Um, but I do that number one to make sure that they're looking at all the machines and number two, 
um, because that information is good to have if you need to order parts or a lot of times, you know, if you call your mechanic and you say, Hey, I got this machine down, you know, here's what it's doing. A lot of times they're going to know over the phone, the likely problem or problems with it. And if you have that model number and serial number to give them um, in front of you, a lot of times they can order the parts ahead of times instead of coming out, you know, getting that information, then ordering the parts, then having to come back out a second time. Uh, a lot of time you, you can shortcut that stuff there. Um, so use that information, <laughs> learn from, from William's mistake and uh, make sure that they're going through all that equipment and doing a good job. So. I, I would second that idea. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of times they'll just come in and they'll kind of spin it and they'll say, you know, you're in good shape as long as the bearings in good shape. So they'll spin the drum. And if they don't hear a bad bearing, um, then they'll be like, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, which, you know, the bearing is the big thing, but you know, those little things can add up to two, three, $400 repairs add up pretty quick. So Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, um, I've had a lot of those little things go wrong, but then I've also, um, you know, when they come in, I, they probably think I'm really annoying, but I mean, I'm, I'm rubbernecking and looking over their shoulder the entire time, not necessarily to like checking out, you know, to make sure they're doing things right. But I just, I'm trying to learn and understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and everything, because, you know, that's, for me, that's like a free learning experience each time they come in. Cause I can just sit there and ask, you know, they don't charge me more if I ask questions. So I just kind of try and figure out what's this piece do? What's this? Why does this, you know, why are you replacing this? What tells you that this has to go wrong? Um, and then actually keeping track of all that, those repairs and which machines got repaired. Um, and that's more kind of on, on the analytics side, just so I can keep track of like, Hey, how do I, you know, is there, you know, preventive maintenance I should be doing on these things and stuff. Um, if I start seeing like kind of a, a rash of, of, you know, recurring costs that I'm uh, re, recurring repairs on, you know, on similar type machines and stuff. So, yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that's a great tip. Uh, especially, you know, I know a lot of people who are getting in the industry are getting in, uh, and wanting to either get their, you know, get their hands dirty, do a little bit of the stuff themselves, or maybe you're coming in with a tighter budget. You don't have a huge budget to put towards machine repairs. You know, a, a really good tip is hire a mechanic to come in a couple of times early on and look over their shoulder, ask them questions and learn on your own. There's also a lot of times distributors, although now has been a little, hopefully we're moving back into where we can do this, but <clears throat> distributors will have um, like free repair classes basically um, where you can go there and learn how to repair their machines. You know, I know there's a couple of distributors here who do those repair classes. And basically what they do is they wheel out their, you know, top load washer and they take it apart and explain it and then put it back together right in front of you and explain it and allow you to ask questions. Then they'll do the same with the front load washer. Then they'll do the same with the dryer. Um, it's a really great way to learn, um, you know, how the machines work, which will help you diagnose problems when problems come up, but also, you know, show you how to make repairs when, when you got to make those repairs, especially if you're trying to pinch pennies. There's a, there's a lot of people who will argue, Hey man, your time is more valuable. Uh, you know, doing something else to build your business, uh, than doing repairs. And while that might be true, sometimes early on, you don't have that option. You got to make those repairs <laughs> yourself. So it's good to have that information. Yeah. Well, I think mine's kind of twofold one. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to save a couple, couple bucks, but that's not really my primary motivator. I don't think, um, you know, I think I really am just interested in like being able to understand the machines and be able to like, you know, quickly diagnose if something's like, this is a, issue I need to deal with right now. This is an issue that I can put off for a little bit so I can kind of triage and prior prioritize what I'm, what I'm focusing on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think at a certain point you, you stop doing that and, <laughs> you know, but that's, I think, you know, like you said early on, um, I'd like to check out those, those classes. Um, but I think my machines are probably too old. They're like Flintstones machines. They got little <laughs> critters in there. Right? <laughs> so, so, <maybe. laughs> so I don't know if they wheel spinning the drums. That's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I don't know if they have classes for, for mine anymore, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well, I, I have to check that out. Yeah. But it can help you learn principles. A lot of the principles are still the same or pretty similar. You know, yeah. obviously they've gotten more efficient and more, you know, there's more technology embedded in them now. Um, but 
a lot of the principles are still the same. So I think you can still learn a lot, even about some of the older machines. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So you went through, you did your due diligence. Uh, was there any kind of renegotiations or anything during due diligence or things go pretty smoothly? No, they went pretty smoothly. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, we, we ended up closing like a week early because I was like, yeah, let's just, let's just get it done. I'm, I'm ready. So we had no reason to just sit there and, and wait for the closing date. So, um, and the, you know, the owner, uh, has been great. Like, you know, I went, um, I recently got married. He, he looked over after the place, like when I was gone for my wedding and like, you know, when I was doing behind me. So I still got a good relationship with him and, you know, he's got a second store as well, like right down the street and he's kind of in the process of retiring. So, um, you know, so, you know, he's still in the area anyway, so he can just kind of pop in and, and look after it. Um, but you know, like the change machine jo- jammed up while I was gone and he went in there and cleared it out. And so it was, it was nice. It's nice having, you know, having that relationship with him still that he's, he's willing to kind of help out and so forth. So, yeah. Does he still have keys to your change machine? No, he does not. I okay. left him with my, actually, I left him with my friend who ha- gave me the idea <laughs> that I had lunch with. Uh-huh. And so when, when I was gone, I was like, Hey, you know, if, if something goes wrong, can you have these keys to, you know, check in? He was going to actually go in and drop in, you know, $500 and quarters. Um, just, just re I was going to have him do a collection, but Hey, just drop in, you know, all this stuff just to, so that I make sure there's, I don't run out. Um, and then he realized that it was off. And so I had the owner call or swing by and he got it, the jam cleared and got it reset. So yeah, yeah pr- appreciated <laughs> that, that, uh, him going the extra mile there. Yeah, no, it really is that it really is cool. And a lot of times I've found that, you know, owners are like that and they're willing to help you out. They want, you know, especially, you know, if owners who've owned it for a really long time. A lot of times these laundromats have like, put their kids through college and, you know, help them buy a pool for their backyard or whatever. Like Mm -hmm. these laundromats are, have meant a lot to them and their families. And so, you know, a lot of times they're willing to, you know, help you out, especially if you're brand new in the business because they want to see their, you know, their laundromat that they've put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into, you know, keep, keep rolling. So, yeah. That's well, and awesome. that's, that's also one of the reasons that, you know, when I was going through the due diligence process, like I didn't kind of nickel and dime as, you know, I probably could have a little bit, but I was <laughs> like, I want to maintain this relationship. So I'm going to like, I'm not going to get up in arms about every little thing that I see. Hey, like that lights out. Let's get that fixed before I move in. Like, let's, let's, let's just maintain this relationship. And then we'll, I can take care of some of this little, little stuff instead of being a, you know, being a pain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times you'll find that you get a lot more value that way, especially somebody like this guy who maybe has owned them for a while and knows the business. Well, you're going to get a lot more value out of, you know, picking his brain along the way mm-hmm. than, you know, nickel and diamond for light bulbs and, you know, whatever cobwebs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Smart. I think that's smart. And a lot of people will kind of nickel and dime. And I mean, that's one way of doing things. Um, but you know, I think during the transaction, look for value, right? And if you find value in maintaining that relationship, then maybe that's worth more than getting a light bulb replaced or, you know, yeah. whatever, replacing the <laughs> toilet paper roll before you come in or I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't negotiate on that one. I had to, had to have that replaced. So. <laughs> hey, two ply, man, two ply all the way. <laughs> None of that little, tissue yeah. that you can see. No, no wiggle room on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. So you closed down the deal. This, this owner, well, congrats on getting married. First of all. Oh, thank That's you. A big, big deal. That must've been very recently that you got married because you haven't had your laundromat too long. Correct. Yeah. So it was about one month after I purchased the laundromat, which was it made for a busy month. So, uh, but you know, I just, I just knew the opportunity was too good and we discussed it and we're like, Hey, like I, it's in a steady state right now. So I can kind of be hands off the first month. Like we'll just get it. We'll just kind of not really do much for it the first month. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, once, once we get back and kind of get settled, we can start actually kind of wrenching on it and, um, putting a little bit more time in it. Yeah. 
Uh, so the real question is, where'd you guys go for your honeymoon? What'd you do? <laughs> well, we took, we took, a, I guess it was a honeymoon light because you can't really go anywhere I right know, now. But, like, but you... so we, we got married up in Sedona and then we, um, nice. we're gonna like, we were just going to come home and, and go back to work. Cause we wanted to do like a, maybe a vacation to like, you know, Spain or something, something, you know, kind of, you know, yeah. grand fun. Um, but can't do that right now. So, um, we went down to, you know, just so it didn't feel like we went right back to our normal life. We went down to Puerto <laughs> Vallarta for a few days and hey, all just, right. uh, with zero plans and just hung out and, um, just, in, just enjoyed, uh, enjoyed paradise. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. I, Cause I was like, man, it's, it's been really hard this last year, especially for people who are, you know, graduating people who are getting married, all these kind of big things. It's like, what do you, how do you celebrate? Like, especially early on, you couldn't go out to dinner even. You yeah. Know? So like how, how do you even do that? But that's awesome. I'm glad you guys got to get away, go, you know, sit and relax, you know, by a pool or the beach or something. And, you know, feel like you had at least a little bit of a honeymoon, hopefully you get one, you know, a bigger one, a more grand one Yeah. in the near future. Yeah. Or here's the hoping. The hoping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in the meantime, I mean, the second best thing to a honeymoon is owning a laundromat. So geez, man, you're, you're still preaching living to the, the dream. choir. <laughs> still living the dream. How does she feel about the laundromat? She is not as active. She doesn't get as ex- quite as excited about it as I do, but yeah. I, I know that she loves me because she will sit there and tolerate me talking about the laundromat, yeah. you know, for more than any person should. <laughs> so. You're still in the honeymoon phase. That's, that's yeah. the thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, but it's, uh, you know, she, she comes a couple, uh, days a week to, to help out as well. But, uh, I'd say I'm probably most, you know, mostly hands on most hands on with it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm pretty much, I'm in there every single night, um, you know, cleaning up and, um, you know, for me, it's, it's almost like a end of day meditation. Like you just kind of, it's, it's very Zen just going in there cleaning and, you know, getting yeah. everything back together and, and setting up, getting ready for the next day. And, um, yeah, especially with my, my job, which is, you know, very mentally taxing, like just getting to go in there and do something that's, you know, just simple and, um, enjoyable is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great way for me to kind of wrap up the day each day. Well, I'm glad. I really hope it stays that way. I will tell you <laughs> not to rain on your, on your laundromat honeymoon, but yesterday I went to my laundromat and literally there was a coffee cup in there mm-hmm. full of poop. Somebody pooped in the coffee cup and just left it in the laundry. <laughs> so, oh, so I mean, it's not I've, always in, it's not, always I've, in. <laughs> I've had plenty, you know, I, my, my laundry brings in some pretty interesting things. A lot of drug use, a lot of, a yeah. lot of that. The bathroom's mm-hmm. been pretty in pretty, um, questionable shape a number of times. And, you know, it's, yeah. um, but I think, I think that's a, a good point though. I mean, it does stuff doesn't really rattle me too much. Like I just, you know, I just kind of, if that's not your, uh, if you don't think that's your jam, like that probably not the right, <laughs> right industry yeah. for you. I want to call that my jam, but it's not, <laughs> it's not, uh, overly offensive to me, I suppose. Yeah. 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 And it, you're right. And it, and all this, you know, just, just so everybody's clear, like this is not every laundromat everywhere, but there are, I mean, something to be aware of is, you know, there are certain laundromats in certain locations where if you're in a little bit of a rougher area, um, then you, there are things that you will have to deal with that, you know, if you feel like that's going to be overwhelming for you having, you know, graffiti pop up on stuff or, you know, a coffee cup full of poo or whatever, whatever the case may be, like, then you might want to consider looking in a different area and passing on a laundromat, even if it's a good deal, if that stuff is going to phase you, um, you know, it's just kind of part of, part of the business at certain, yeah. certain locations, certain areas. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Well, how, I mean, you've been a little bit preoccupied during part of your, I mean, you haven't, how long have you owned it? So about two months now. So not, not okay. super long. Yeah. So you own it for two months and you've had a wedding and a short honeymoon in that time period. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you have been extremely, extremely involved in planning the wedding and stuff. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, I mean, what's your experience been like over the last couple months so far? I mean, it's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's, 
it probably came in a little bit on the lower end of what I was hoping. Like, you know, it, it wasn't like doomsday scenario, but it was like, you know, suboptimal scenario number two. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just yeah. like, you know, it wasn't, wasn't perfect, but you know, it's, it's, it's more than paying the bills and, you know, with a little bit of money extra, over, you know, um, left over after repairs and, and everything else that you pay for. Um, and so, you know, I've got some financing too that I'm paying off each month. So yeah, like, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not a, a cash cow necessarily, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's doing well. Um, you know, additionally, you know, I, I mean, kind of the first thing I went, like I did when I got in there is I, um, you know, kind of made a, a list of, Hey, this is all the stuff that I need to do. Like, let's just like sit down and figure out like what all I need to do. Um, and then I don't know if you're familiar with like stack ranking and how, how that process kind of looks, but Ooh, tell um, me about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I basically created like a stack. It's like a triage process where you um, look at all the things and you say, Hey, like what's, you know, where ultimately where can I get the most bang for my buck? Because, you know, mm-hmm. when you have 50 to a hundred projects, one that you want to do is hard to kind of make heads or tails of it. If you don't have kind of a structured approach to, to figure out which one you want to want to focus on. So, mm-hmm. you know, I looked at like, Hey, okay, I want to do, you know, this project, what is the um, level of effort that I need to put in, you know, personally, what's the time commitment to do this project? What is the uh, cost commitment to do this project? What is the expected ROI of this uh this project, what is the um, customer experience increase that I'm going to see from this project? And then kind of, you know, build that and then see, you know, hey, what's, you know, I can look at it and say, hey, um, for the least amount of money, what's the highest ROI items that I, I can get for this? Um, and, you know, so I can, and, or what's the things that I think is going to have the biggest impact on customer experience? Um, and then kind of look at like, you know, from a cost and, you know, personal labor perspective, what means the most to me? Well, I'd rather have lower costs and put in more labor. So for me personally, that's, that's how I would structure it. And so I put more weight on, um, cost and less weight on, you know, actual, you know, labor that I'm providing myself. Um, so, so then I, you know, that's all personal to you, whatever, whatever's more important to you. Um, and so from there I started, you know, just, knocking out projects. So, you know, like one of the first things I did is I put in all new led lights because the lights were horrible. Um, they, they didn't have, um, they were old, you know, non energy efficient, uh, lights. And so I, I put new ones in and talked to my electrician, the ROI on that was eight months and they pay for themselves, Mm -hmm. um, just to do that. And then, um, you know, and it looks, 10 times better with that going in. Um, also I could do other projects that I was working on while he was doing that. I didn't even have to really have a time commitment. Um, it wasn't super expensive. So, um, you know, it's just trying to find those quick wins that, that you can really like, you know, um, put those back to back, like, you know, even like doing Google map, taking, um, you know, a few hours and doing optimizing my Google maps profile, um, doing, putting in some Google advertising, um, getting better pictures put on there. Just, just all this stuff that I know, like, Hey, I'm going to get a big bank. Like what's going to be better if I paint the bathroom or do this, (laughs) right? (laughs) This just gives you a mode for thinking about it. That's, that's less, um, you know, maybe emotional or, um, or, prone to just, you know, not taking into consideration all the different variables. Um, so I, I think that's a, it's a really good way to structure your, your projects and, and think about how you want to approach them. Yeah. I like that way of thinking about, thinking about stuff and, um, and, and helping you make decisions on what to focus, especially when there's a lot to do, right? Maybe you're buying a new laundromat that has a lot to do. Maybe <clears throat> you own a laundromat and you've kind of let it go a little bit and you got a lot of stuff to do, but thinking about it this way and considering those variables, like what is the ROI? <clears throat> How much time is it going to take, you know, to do it? How much is it going to cost to do it? How much, you know, how much do I want to do myself and how much time is that going to take? Or do I want to hire out and how much time is that going to take and how much money is it going to save or, or cost me? Um, and kind of prioritize using that to prioritize your list, I think is a great way of doing it. And I know a lot of coaching clients that I've had who've come in 
you know, wanting to who've who've bought laundromats that need fixing up can be so overwhelmed, you know, by just the number of things that need to be done. And, you know, if they hire everything out, how much all that's going to cost. Um, and so trying to figure out, okay, what do I need to focus on? And if I can't afford to do everything, what do I, what do I do? What do I focus on? And that gives kind of a really good rubric to think about it and, and figure out how to prioritize, you know, what you should do. And I love real quick. I love, uh, your, when you said, I'm looking for quick wins. Right. And I think mm-hmm. that's a huge thing when you take over a laundromat, even if you take over a turnkey laundromat, <clears throat> looking for some quick wins that number one will give you a little bit of confidence, you know, now that you own the business and number two will show your customers that, Hey, a new owner's here, but look, they're, they're doing something that is, you know, good for, me as the customer and good for the business. So whether that's replacing the lighting, slapping on some paint in the bathroom, whatever the case may be, mm-hmm. um, you know, those quick wins are, are awesome both for you and for the customer. So I love that concept. Uh, yeah. Another quick win um, for a lot of people <clears throat> is um, raising prices uh, pretty quickly. When you take over a store, it's pretty natural to, it's a natural time to raise prices if your if your store is underpriced, and that can feel a little awkward, kind of coming in and raising prices immediately. And people might initially be a little bit miffed, but probably not. Um, but even if they are, if they see that you're doing other things to help improve the store, you're putting in new lighting, you're painting the bathroom, whatever the case may be, um, then a lot of times they're gonna be okay with it. And even if they are upset, I found that when I've raised prices and customers have been upset they've really only been upset the first time they come in. And then after that, everybody's fine. (laughs) So um, (laughs) I love the concept of quick wins. Uh, What are some other things that you're, that are on your list that you want to be doing? Well, most, I mean, honestly, most of it's cosmetic. Um, You know, I I think the the business is, you know, it it runs very well. Um, But uh, cosmetically, it still needs, needs a makeover. So I've got like, that's the next month. Um, is what I have planned in is going, you know, pretty much, you know, uh, my Memorial Day weekend is spoken for. <laughs> so I'm going to be in there, um, you know, re- repainting the entire place, um, you know, fixing the ceiling, you know, it's a drop ceiling. So fixing the ones that have like, um, you know, um, sagging and stuff yeah. and got stains from water and so forth. Um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, I, I just... I really do have like a customer centric uh, approach to the business. I want to make the the place of, you know, doing laundry is not something that everybody really gets excited for, uh, you know, when they have to go in. So I like to make it as painless as possible when they get it going there, that it's not dimly lit. The machines work. Um, it's, it's generally nice. It's cool. As cool as you can make it in the summer in Phoenix. Um, and so, you know, my main thing is just trying to smooth out some of the friction points with the customer to ensure that they have an enjoyable experience when they go into the laundromat. Um, and so that's, that's the main thing that I'm really focused on right now. Um, also, you know, I've, I've been, um, well, so I, I, I want to put in like TVs and stuff, but it's an unattended laundromat. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm in a, in a kind of a questionable neighborhood. So, um, what I've been doing, what I just did was, um, you know, the security cameras actually didn't work, um, but they had a security camera system. So I, I found out who the dealer or who the, um, system was bought through, found a dealer in the neighborhood, had them come in. Um, and for a hundred dollars, I was able to get this, you know, thousand dollar system back up and running. So now it's like recording. I put out a TV, um, a little monitor so people can see that it's being recorded with a little surveillance thing, um, to try and get people, cause we have a lot of people who go in there and, and you know, use drugs, um, in the back of the store. I, you know, I had the police there on Wednesday, trying, you know, dealing with, you know, someone who kept coming back and doing the same thing after I, you know, you know, asked them, asked them very nicely, pretty nicely uh, to, to leave a number of times. Um, and so, you know, my main thing is just like trying to get this, so customers can go in there and not have like, you know, these quality of life issues where people are, you know, um, doing drugs or, you know, drinking and in, in the store and using it as a, you know, a second, second home. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I, I love, I did the same thing. I put the monitor out so people could see the cameras and that helped a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I cracks me up. They would, um, I had multiple people early on, I had multiple people get up and stick their face in the camera and then <laughs> try to mess with the camera, like to, to either turn it or block it somehow or something so they could yeah. do whatever they want to do. And I'm like, dude, wait, your face is in the camera. Like I can see you <laughs> like right now it's happening. Um, yeah. But it did help. The other thing that helped is I would call the police for everything. Even mm-hmm. if nobody was there, you know, when it, when I got there and there was like graffiti or if I got there and somebody, you know, I found evidence of drug use, um, I would call the police for everything. And what that did was it would, the police would get it, you know, kind of irritated with me a little bit, um, you know, or they, they felt bad, but they also would kind of get a little irritated. I'd call for <laughs> small stuff, but then what they started doing was they put special watch on, which means they would drive by on their own, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, periodically throughout the day, throughout the night, whatever. And that just communicated to, you know, the, the people in the community that number one, the police were going to be there. So it was going to be safer. And number two, if I didn't want to see the police, I don't want to be there because the police keep coming by there. So, yeah. Um, so that helps a lot calling for every little, thing. Um, and then also pressing charges, which is kind of annoying to have to do. Um, but word does get around. And so once you press charges once or twice on something, word does get around and, you know, people stop coming there if they know that you're going to press charges on stuff. So that's another little tip, which is, yeah. I, and I think that's kind of the direction I'm going to, because the people, you know, if, if they don't feel like there's going to be any repercussions, they're just going to they keep keep doing it. So, um, yeah. And uh, I mean, the sad, well, at least here, the sad thing is, is that even when I call the police, there's no repercussions other than the police <laughs> saying, hey, leave and don't come back. But there's yeah. really, I mean, the their, their hands are pretty tied. And, you know, basically they've told me not so many words that, you know, you might have to take care of your own problem, <laughs> which is kind of sad, but yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways. Uh, okay. So man, let's talk about, well, can, I, I want to kind of transition a little bit to, uh, to data and, you know, you, you sent me this presentation. Can you tell, just tell me a little bit about this presentation that you did you sent me the, the, the slides for it. Um, where did, inspiration for that come from? What was that presentation for? And maybe just like a quick overview of that presentation. Yeah. So I was doing, getting my graduate degree in business analytics over at Arizona state. And, um, we had a presentation that we had to, uh, everybody had to start. It was kind of a, not necessarily a capstone presentation, but towards the end of our program, um, where you wanted to use all the different, you know, knowledge that we had gained at that point to, um, come up with a business idea and present it to the, um, to the rest of the class. And then people would be able to invest money in that idea. And then, you know, the people who got the most investments would, um, you know, be crowned the winners, uh, wouldn't really do anything, but, um, so my, you know, I, this, this is during the height of my, of a uh, laundromat mania in my, you know, when I was, you know, that was, I was, I was all about it. And, um, you know, I, I'd been thinking about this a lot. And so I was just thinking about all the different ways that, um, you know, analytics could help help you run run the business better. And um, you know, I think I was not aware of some of the sophistication at the time of some of the you know new washers and dryers and some of the stuff that they actually do have. You know, I was going based more on my mode of thinking that everything is just a coin, you know, coin based uh, laundry. Um, I, I knew about card systems and stuff, but I just didn't know how um, you know how sophisticated exactly they were. Um, but yeah, so I, I started building out this idea, like how, how could you build a, you know, a smart laundromat, I guess, um, where you have, where you have analytics on, you know, every single part of the customer journey. Um, because I think right now, a lot of the stuff that you do, you know, your customers do it kind of, once they do it, if you don't capture it, it goes into the ether. You don't Mm -hmm. know, you don't know what they did. They don't know what button they pressed. You don't know, um, you know, which machines they used. You don't know if they use those machines time and time again, you don't know when they can't, you know, if you got quarter machines, you don't know when they usually come in, you don't know all this stuff. I was like, how can we, how can we completely understand the customer journey? Um, so, you know, part of it's like capturing, you know, 
customer information. So I'm using some type of card or uh, app-based mobile payment system. I'm capturing, you know, uh, specific, you know, you, it can be anonymized. You don't need to know the customer's details specifically, but if you, I mean, if you can get um, information on them, you know, age, you know, uh, whatever, like different demographic information that obviously that makes it stronger. Um, but you get into ethical stuff with that, but just for, to be simplicity's sake, you know, let's look at, you know, just, um, customer data. Let's look at machine usage data. Um, let's look at, um, you know, you can even do some IOT data. So internet of things like different sensors and stuff you can put on, let's say on the door that tells you every time someone walks in, you can put, you know, something, um, you know, heck on the bathroom. Every time someone comes in, how often are people using the bathroom going in and out of the door? Like just, just really understanding every last, uh, aspect of the business. Um, And, you know, you don't really know what you're going to do with that data necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of part of the, uh, the structure of, or part of the thing that we discussed in the the presentation was um, a lot of this is kind of exploratory. Like we're just going to capture all this data. I don't know if it's useful or not, but let's just capture it all. And then, you know, try and try and do some analysis on it. And so obviously you can do predictive analytics with that stuff where you, um, where you look at like, Hey, what's my expected future revenue going to be based on this? What, what can I expect customer behavior to be based on this? Um, but what you can also do is stuff like uh, cluster analysis, which is a really cool thing that, um, seems like kind of, intimidating, but it's, it's actually, it's, it's pretty simple and it's, um, you know, it's, are, are you, I don't know if you're familiar with cluster analysis, but, um, you basically yeah. it, can you explain it a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it's really like, let the chips fall where they may is kind of like the, the idea is like you throw all this data out there and you just kind of see how it groups naturally. Um, so like a, a good, uh, I think the easiest way to think about it is if you took a, let's, um, we're, now we're not getting political on this show, but if you took a, 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 a um, uh, survey of people and they're, they're, you know, let's say for political beliefs and you said, Hey, you know, how do you feel about the second amendment? How do you feel about, you know, immigration? How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? Um, and you had someone fill that out. Non surprisingly, you're naturally going to have two clusters of, of groups that kind of arise and they're going to have pretty similar answers. You know, you're going to have some outliers here and there. Um, but you know, it's not, it's definitely not going to be randomized. Um, and you can use that data to kind of understand your customers as well. Like, Hey, you may have a cluster here where it's, um, you know, 20 to, or, you know, 18 to 25 year olds. Um, they generally do one to two loads of laundry. Um, they they come in on, you know, Sundays late at night, or they come in, you know, or, you know, weekdays late at night, they like, you start getting this, you know, profiles of just like allowing the data to kind of, uh, like, you know, uh, tell you or show you what's might, might be happening, um, by just, um, letting it kind of, cl- you know, create clusters, as you mm-hmm. say. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then you can kind of figure out like, Hey, these are the different customer profiles that I have. I have this, you know, head of household, um, females that come in, they do, you know, a large amount of laundry. Like, you know, they do maybe eight loads of laundry and they spend X amount. I have this type of customer. I have this type of customer. Um, and so when you have that, then you can kind of, uh, use leverage that information to tailor your experience to, to best fit those people's needs. Um, and so that's, that's really where, you know, you can, um, use data to, to, create better experiences for your customer when you know your customer better. So, um, it it feels maybe feels a little Orwellian when you, when you talk about it, but, um, (laughs) I, I feel like as, as long as you're, um, you know, you're, you're, you're maintaining people's privacy effectively. Um, and you know, your, your intentions there to, you know, provide a better customer experience for them. Um, and use that to improve your business. I, 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 uh, I think, uh, um, you're in good shape, but yeah, that was, that was kind of the thesis. And that's kind of 
um, what we argued in, in the, the presentation is you can use all this um, to do this. And it, it is a fragmented market. No one's really currently doing this at scale. Um, and so now we didn't get first, but we did, I think, get second for <laughs> for uh, for investments okay. with it. So Time out. a little disappointing. First. What is <laughs> what's better than this? Come on. You know, and the thing is, I, I can't remember. So exactly. it couldn't have been that good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we'll just say that your class probably wasn't, you know, the sharpest group. I mean, that's yeah, the only it's a, it's possible a, explanation. It's embarrassing for them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's awesome. And I think that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we can start doing even on a single store level, um, you know, in terms of collecting, I hadn't even really put in to my kind of thinking about it, the internet of things and using that. Cause I think that opens a lot of possibilities. Just as soon as you said that my mind started turning about just different possibilities of the, you know, what you can collect, you know, cars in and out of the parking lot, people in and out of the doors, you know, all that, um, all that stuff that you can, um, the information that you can gather it, you know, a, you know, up until now, I guess you can have varying degrees of information about like machine usage, for example. Um, but, you know, once you kind of integrate Internet of Things and do it, you can get, you know, more a, a wider range of the user experience from the whole process of entering into your parking lot and walking through your doors, you know, all the way through the process of leaving and mm -hmm. what that whole experience is like. Um, so I really like the idea of that and seeing, like you said, I don't really know exactly what, inf what, you know, conclusions will be drawn from that or what, how you can utilize that information. But I do think that there is potentially some value in, you know, being able to, uh, you know, put, put a number basically to the whole experience to, all the parts of the whole customer experience, um, in, in seeing where you, you can improve that, um, improve your, your services or your business there, your offerings to the customers, um, or where you should focus more of your energy and where you should focus less of your energy. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, uh, I, I love, I mean, we've already talked about stack ranking and we've talked about <laughs> cluster analysis. Are there other ways that we should be utilizing the data? You know, cause I think that there's a lot of owners out there that have access to this data, whether it's through having a card system or maybe they just keep track of <clears throat> things like turns per day or, you know, just whatever information that they're keeping track of, how do, how do we use it? I think that's where maybe a lot of owners might get tripped up a little bit if they have the data they don't really know how do i how do i use it to make better decisions and i think the cluster analysis and the stack ranking um are definitely you know ways to to utilize it are there other things that we should be doing with this data yeah and i mean cluster analysis may be a little down the road for for a lot of people but um i think some of the more immediate um things you can do or there are a lot of more immediate things you can do with the data um no, I mean, the first things first, I mean, is, is creating data sets that are, you know, viable, I suppose, um, and, and that you're able to, to use. Um, you know, I did some, some volunteering for a local um, jazz non for profit here in town. And so they provided me with a, a big data set that they'd been using to, to track all their musician pay and this stuff. And we were trying to create some models to understand, um, expect, you know, t ticket sales for each day and, and things like that, or predict ticket sales. And, um, you know, I started going through the data and it's, it's just, you know, they're using different date formats, you know, every, you know, here and there, like sometimes they're including the year, sometimes they're not, sometimes they're, you know, they're, writing out the word three, sometimes they're saying three, you know, putting the number three, sometimes it's three dash or, you know, you know whatever dash, here's some notes about what happened. Um, so, you know, so I think, um, you know, I think people kind of have to understand how data gets digested a little bit and how, how you can actually utilize it. Like creating a viable data set is, you know, you, you have consistency um, in all, you know, all the columns that you're using, you're using the same formatting. Um, so like if you're, if you have categories, you're using the same 
um, you're using the same uh, verbiage each time. So, um, you know, if you said like, you know, dryer, uh, you know, for one cat, you know, dryer, then dryer issue, dryer, whatever. Like if you keep mixing it up, then you can't really slice it and dice it effectively. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's some of it's just structuring your data in a way that's actually usable to you. Um, It's kind of the first like out the gate is you just have to be able to build data sets that are actually um, actually usable. Um, If you have that, if you have the data sets um, already, um, fantastic. Um, Then like determining like what you want to keep track of. Um, So, I mean, I've got a, I've got a bunch of stuff. Like right now I keep track of, initially I took, kept track of revenue every single day. I would do um, collections because I wanted to know like every day what things were, um, how much we were making. Um, but then I was able to get some other analytics that uh, allowed me to actually infer um, what the uh, amount was each day based on um, some utility bills. And I found that that was tightly correlated and I didn't really need to keep pulling it every single day. Um, so then I started splitting out and looking at, um, you know, what is, you know, I'm going to look at front loaders, top loaders, and dryers. I'm going to do my collections differently. So I know how much I'm making from all those different ones. And for this is for a coin based. If you're card based, awesome. You don't have to worry about this stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so then I have, you know, I, 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 um, through the electric company, I can pull in how much you know, electricity I use, uh, what was the temperature that day, or the high temperature and the low temperature, which in Phoenix actually really has a big impact on you know how many people show up to your laundromat when mm-hmm. it's 110 degrees versus when it's 70 degrees. Um, you know that stuff actually impacts you. Um, so I have this this huge data set that I use, and um, you know I, I I take in like how many impressions I had in Google, how many clicks I had in Google that day, how much I spent in Google Analytics, and so this is all formatted on you know date by day or day by day. Um, I've got just this massive data set that I'm I'm collecting that um, I can go in there and I can kind of play around with and see um, <clears throat> what what is actually. Um, moving the needle is this stuff actually, you know, does, you know, paying money to Google, does that have any impact? I um, mean, you've talked about AB testing in the past, like doing stuff like that with your advertising. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, so once you have that data set, then, you know, being able to do some basic things in um, Excel are really important. So, um, if you don't know how to use pivot tables, um, Go online. There's so many resources uh, for for using pivot tables, and that allows you to you know. I just have you know my data set with a and then another slide or another sheet with a bunch of pivot tables where I just have like a dashboard where I can see all the different metrics for my business, how much I'm making average per day, how much I'm making week over week, how much I'm you know uh, the the sum per week, the average per week, the whatever. I just have have everything quickly broken down. So all I have to do is input that data and everything automatically gets generated to those. Um, and can you explain real quick what a pivot table is? Yeah, a pivot table is um, basically you have rows and columns. So, like, let's say um, I want to say my row is or my row is um, day of the week. So I have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So that's you're going to see that on the left hand side, and then up above, um, I might would just want to say um, what do I want to look at? Well, I want to look at average um, average revenue per day. Um, so what it's going to do is it's going to look through my whole data set. It's going to average out for every Sunday, every Monday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how much was generated that day. And then it's going to basically create a, uh, a grid for me where I can look and, and see how much, um, you know, how much I average each day. And so it, it's, it's some it, pivot tables take a little bit to master. I think it take they take a second to learn. Um, but, but what they allow you to do is to really slice and dice data in an effective manner mm-hmm. um, and gain a lot of insights very quickly without a, without a lot of work. Um, so they, they do the heavy lifting of the analytics for you. Um, I'm sure there's uh, some people on, uh, on, YouTube that can explain them much better than I can. <laughs> but, I'll include a link uh, on the show notes or free on YouTube. It's down in the description. I'll include a link to a tutorial that'll help you 
mm-hmm. grasp uh, pivot tables and show you how to make them. So yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so pivot tables are are kind of like a, a must must have. Um, if if you re- and so I mean honestly, that can get most people. You know, I think for a lot of people that can get you. You know, most of the way there. Um, if you really want to um, try and understand. Um, your business, you know, different how different uh, variables in your business impact your revenue. Um, you know, like regression analysis um, and logistic regression is a really cool tool. Um, again, hopefully, we can provide some kind of link in the uh, in the show notes for mm-hmm. people who who want to uh, learn a little bit more about that. I'm sure there's uh, someone on there that, that explains it much much clearer than I do. But um, in in general, what that does is it, it shows you the relationship between um, your revenue. Let's let's use revenue for this example and some other variable. So let's let's actually use you know the the weather in Phoenix is a pretty good example. So you know you know as the heat increases. Um, you know, the amount of revenue I'm going to get is going to decrease. And so mm-hmm. what it will do is give me a formula where I can say, hey, here's the um here's the temperature today. How much revenue should I expect? Um now, as we as you can imagine, that's an incomplete model because that's not the only variable that dictates right. that, but it will it will give you something <clears throat> and then it will tell you how much of the variability um in that model is explained by this one factor. Um so you know, for the heat, maybe it explains five percent of the variability, ten percent of the variability. You know, that is a factor, it's not the biggest factor, um, but maybe you add um the the temperature and the day of the week, um, and then you're hey. You might be explaining eighty percent of you know the variability, and then you know you you start adding in more and more um, more and more items, and it's gonna it's gonna actually start giving you a pretty good picture, and you're gonna start understanding which um, which factors in the business do matter and don't matter. Because if you find there's no you know there's no um, there, there's really no relationship between this this factor and and your revenue, well, great, you don't have to. You know, you you may not spend a bunch of time and, and energy focusing on that stuff when it really doesn't move the needle for you as a business. Um, so so yeah, I mean, and and obviously, you know, you have to kind of understand you know regression as well. Like there's a um, a relative range where that stuff is effective because you know if you're taking temperature and you say, hey, every degree of the temperature goes goes up, I lose five dollars. Well, that's you know that's only going to work for a relative range. Cause you know, as you go down, you know, if you're gaining $5 for every degree, well, if it's negative 20 out, that's probably, yeah. <laughs> probably, probably not the you know case. You're not going to be, you know, you know, rich beyond your wildest dreams because, you know, it's a negative 20. It's, you know, it, there, there's only, you know, it doesn't work uh, quite perfectly. You have to understand the limitations of it, <laughs> but it will give you a good, I, a good way to to think about um, how the relationship of those variables are, you know, what it is to your business. Yeah, it's the only time somebody would be like, "I really hope it's negative forty today." <laughs> Going to be I'm rich, be a billionaire. <laughs> Get that uh, Tesla. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, I. I love, love, love what you're saying. Uh, I think you're probably speaking a foreign language to a lot of laundromat owners uh, and who aren't going to understand that. But one of the cool things is, and we will add, um, we will add links, uh, you know, for all the stuff, pivot tables, regression analysis, all that stuff. Um, so make sure you check those out if it's something you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> but I, you know, I do, I love this because I think that um, I just reread the book principles by Ray Dalio, which I love and highly recommend. Um, if you haven't read it, I'll put a link to that too, but it's, it's an awesome book. Um, but one of the things that Ray Dalio did, he's a, he's a fund manager, um, in the stock market and, uh, one of the, well, stock, well, anyways, just keep it simple. Uh, one of the things that he did was he sort of pioneered using algorithms to make trading decisions and it did something pretty similar to what you're talking about, where they would, um, they would add variables and see how that, you know, performed, um, in the stock market. And then they would test it. They would back test it basically on past performance. And you may have some back data you can test some of your stuff on. You may not, that's fine. Um, but 
one of the things that they did was they continually tweaked it and improved it and added variables and subtracted variables and, you know, added weight to different variables. Um, and, and we can do the same thing, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be on a fun, you know, multi-billion dollar fund <laughs> scale. Uh, but you can add, you know, revenue versus temperature. And then you can add things like time of day. Um, or you can add things like, you know, whatever the case may be, you can start adding variables to get a more and more accurate picture of, you know, what, <clears throat> um, what's happening. And then you can start playing with some of those variables too. So you can, you know, you can add things like, well, you know, on 110 degree day, you know, how, how many people are coming in and doing their laundry and then not drying because they're just going to sit it outside, you know, on their, in their backyard or whatever, you know, how many people are coming in and using bigger washers versus smaller washers on those days? Maybe the people who are coming in are, you know, <clears throat> people who are just doing, they just need a quick single load laundry. Right. And so, you know, maybe they're just coming in and using those top loaders or a small 20 pounder, and they're not really using the bigger ones when it's 110 degrees, you know, so you can get more and more um, precise and more and more complex as you get more and more data and more and more information that you can start to add into these. Um, so I really love, uh, I love that way of thinking um, that you're, that you're talking about. Uh, one of the things, Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and, and then also, and I know it, it probably sounds, uh, you know, foreign and kind of weird, but, uh, you know, regression analysis is something I could show someone how to do um, on the computer in probably 15 minutes. It's very repeatable. It's very easy. Like it's actually, you can do it right in Excel. Um, and, it, you know, you just really, all you do is you highlight two columns and then you press run <laughs> and it tells you the relationship Go. between them. And, yeah. and now, so you have to maybe understand a little bit like, you know, what's an R squared value mean, you know, it's, it's, you know, to try and interpret it a little bit, but it really is super simple. And then, so if you, it's something that you're interested in all, um, yeah, I mean, put a link on there and I'm pretty active on the forums as well. So, um, you know, we can, I'm happy to chat with people if they have any questions about it. Um, because it, it really is a, it, there's some very powerful and very simple tools out there, um, that, that can be super helpful for you. Yeah. Awesome. You mentioned earlier, uh, that you have a dashboard set up. Can you, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about your dashboard and what that, what that looks like? I'm assuming that's in Excel. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I actually just pulled it up right now because I've got it on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really nothing fancy. I mean, so I, I look at um, like we, every week I have like my weekly sum, like how much did I make each week? So it's the weeks are just kind of numbered week 14, week 15, week 16. Um, so I can just see how much, uh, how much income I had for that uh, particular week. Um, then each week, what was the average income per day? Um, then I have like each month, what's my current run rate? And then what's how much have I made historically? Um, I have like daily, like, uh, let's see, or then daily average per month. So what was my daily average um, that month? Um, then weekday average, um, I can see like what Friday, Monday or Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera. Um, how much on average I was making those days. So it's, it's, it's nothing fancy. It's just like, Hey, I just want to know, like, I want to have this in the back of my head uh, so I can see if things are moving up, moving down a little bit. Um, it just gives me a, a pulse <clears throat> on the, on what's happening with my laundromat. Yeah. I think that's really cool. And I think having it all in a dashboard type format where you can get, you can access all that information quickly and easily. And I, I mean, I think it's, I think you said it perfectly, like having a pulse of your business and, you know, if business is going up, then hopefully your data is going to show you, okay, what's happening that's making, you know, business go up and if business is going down. Okay. What's, what's going down? My, is my weekday average going down? Is my weekend average going down or, you know, are there, depending on what kind of data you have, you know, and you're collecting, you can even figure out like what, demographic is, am I losing if it's going down or what demographic am I gaining if it's going up? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I, I mean, I love having all that right there quickly accessible so that you do have a pulse of your business and you can make, 
adjustments accordingly and quickly. And I think quick adjustments has not been a hallmark of laundromat <laughs> owners typically. Um, and I think a big part of that is because we kind of, we have some data that we're going off of and we kind of operate by feel on, you know, on another level. And it's, you know, it can just be tough to see, you know, sometimes we don't have, we don't know what we're doing in a month until the end of the month when we, you know, punch in all our numbers, right. If you're not keeping track of it. And so having all that stuff in a dashboard type format can help you make quicker decisions, better decisions, and have a better understanding of what's happening with your business. Yeah. I love that. Um, man, anything else that you think we need to talk about in terms of, you know, data analysis or collecting data, um, making data valuable and usable? I mean, more at a high level. I mean, if, if I'm, you know, saying like what my, my end game with, with this stuff is, is, um, you know, I think, you know, the people who are going to get ahead are the people who go in and they use data to challenge conventional wisdom in the, uh, in the industry. So I think there's, <clears throat> you know, I, we, we chatted about the um, company I worked for before Carvana a little bit. One of the conventional wisdoms that they challenge is that people don't want to buy a car online. They want to mm-hmm. test drive a car. They don't want to, you know, they won't buy it. People won't buy a car sight unseen. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, everybody, you know, all the dealerships are saying, oh, these, these people are going to go down in flames. Nobody's ever going to do this. But they they done market research. They talked to people. They found that people are very willing to to do this. And uh, more and more, you know, especially more and more people are open to this. And, um, and so they, they challenge this conventional wisdom using data. Um, and so, um, you know, I don't specifically have any ideas that I'm currently challenging, but, you know, if I'm looking at this data and I see stuff that doesn't track with, you know, Hey, this is, you know, this is what I would think is happening, but it doesn't seem to be happening this way. Why is that? Um, try and find, you know, use data to understand, um, things that maybe other people don't currently see. Um, so that's, that's a, a good, a good way to think about it as well as just, you know, what, what can I, what insights can I get, um, using these new technologies, internet of things, things of this nature to get insights that maybe uh, other people haven't had before because they haven't had the ability to get that information. Yeah. I like that using data to challenge conventional wisdom. And, you know, I think that some of the top operators right now are doing that, uh, whether they're doing it using data or they're just doing it using logic. I don't know, but, um, you know, and man, I, I mean, I love even just the ability to, um, to make decisions like, should you replace equipment or not? You know, if you have all the data of how much, you know, what continues to break down, how much it's costing you on average per machine or per month or whatever, however you, you know, synthesize that data, you know, how much utility costs are, how much utility savings it would be, how much a loan payment would be. And you can kind of do, you know, factor in all that data, which people do already. uh, But I think you can get more sophisticated, more precise with it. Then you can know uh, like fairly precisely when you should be replacing equipment. And it's, might be sooner than, than you think, right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's different philosophies on when you should replace equipment, but, um, but having the data kind of takes the philosophy (laughs) out of it to some degree and puts the science and it puts the math into it, you know? Um, so I love that challenging conventional wisdom using data. Genius. Well, and and to your point, I, I would add that to the toolkit of uh, of if anybody who's you know wants to own a laundromat or currently owns a laundromat is is model building. So being able to build a model to make decisions um, and and take in you know hey let's let's weigh these two different decisions using all the all the information I have and does it make more sense to buy new equipment versus um, versus just continue <laughs> to repair the new ones if I you know I can look at the expected costs over the next you know ten years of repairing. Like being able to make those decisions, uh, informed decisions using models is, is I feel like really critical in in running any business. So um, if you're not super familiar with that as well, I I know there's a a ton of resources out there. Yeah. Just on a very basic level, can you give me like an example? Let's say like, should I replace equipment or not? Can you give me like a very basic example of, you know, 
model building to help make that decision? Yeah. So you want to look at like, what are all your inputs? So what, so, I mean, your, your two scenarios are scenario A, um, I'm going to um, completely replace everything. Scenario B, I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to uh, just continue to bandaid fix stuff, you know, for the next however long. Um, so, you know, for scenario A, you need to figure out, okay, well, um, this is the cost, you know, this is going to be my cost. Um, do you have financing? Is there going to be other, other fees that you're going to incur? Um, and then additionally, you know, what are the, you know, um, benefits of that? You know, are you going to, do you think you're going to see increased revenue um, due to these new machines? Maybe you can increase prices a little bit. Um, so you need to start, <clears throat> start thinking about all those different variables that are going to come into that and capture those in the model. Um, <clears throat> for the, and let's say for scenario B, you know, Hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to be, um, uh, you know, Band-Aid fixing this stuff. Um, I expect the costs, you know, are going to increase 10% each year um, for this. So you, you have to build something that's going to incorporate all, all those different um, um, expectations. Um, and then you can, you, you basically just compare at, once you get all those inputs and you, um, you know, feel comfortable with the model um, you can look at it and see, okay, well, what's the, the benefit from scenario A versus scenario B, mm-hmm. um, and so you know each each uh, th- there's always going to be something missing. You're not going to capture everything. Um, a, a good model is only as good as its inputs, and mm-hmm. um, you know so. But it it's like everything else we've kind of talked about. It's just a mode of thinking. It allows you to to take something and to to think about it in an intelligent, rational way. Um, versus you know versus kind of what we do you know. If I was to go through my gut, I'd probably be out of business in uh, in a month because my <laughs> my my gut isn't great. Um, that's why I rely on numbers, um, and so you know it's uh, that that's just kind of I let that do the thinking for me, um, and and build it out that way. Yeah, I love that. And in this particular scenario, you may you know run some of the data and find out that some of the equipment is doing just fine. You know, maybe your 40 and 60 pounders are, they're fine. They're actually not costing you that much money. And it Mm -hmm. turns out it's your top loaders and 20 pounders or whatever, right. That's really costing you. And then you can build a new model where you keep your forties and sixties and you replace your tops in your, in your twenties and see how that compares to the other two models too. So you can get more granular if you want. And uh, again, just make better decisions based on based on the numbers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I mean, if you, if you're not familiar with, you know, time value of money and stuff like that, I mean, it's, it's, it's non, non negligible when you're, when you're doing that kind of analysis as well. So, so learning how to incorporate that is helpful. Um, if you can't do it, doing something without it is still better than nothing. Um, Mm -hmm. but, but being able to do like discount rates on things and, um, you know, understand, you know, Hey, if I, you know, took this hundred thousand dollars and put it into a new laundromat versus, you know, repairing this machine, what would be my ROI, um, opportunity costs associated with all this stuff. So, Mm um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's no shortage of things you need to take into consideration, but, uh, but yeah, I would I would highly suggest people who are in this business to to get comfortable with some level of model building so they can they can start uh, making informed decisions. Yeah, and even if you even if you're brand new to model building or any of these things that we talked about today, the the beauty of these things is that you can get more sophisticated over time, right? You can start very simple and you know, I always talk about when I do a, I do a weekly webinar and about half the time I do one on how to analyze a laundromat deal. Right. And when I talk about, you know, verifying income, I say, Hey, there's a range of what the income can be. And our goal during due diligence is to narrow that range as much as possible. Right. Cause we're, it's really, really difficult to pinpoint exactly how much money is coming in. So we're narrowing the range as much as possible so we can make the best decision possible. And so that's kind of the same, you know, concept. If, if you're building a model, maybe you don't have all the variables, but you have some information and it'll give you some picture that'll have some range. And over time, you can refine the models, you can, you know, 
add new variables and and uh, narrow the range of basically you know whatever your model is is doing uh, narrow the the error in it within your model. Um, all right, we have a little section called secret sauce. Listen up, it's the secret sauce. <laughs> uh, on the podcast. And I want to kind of keep this in the sort of the data, the data, you know, stream of thought here that we're talking about. Secret sauce is something that'll benefit current owners in their current business. If if you had to pick one thing, maybe that we've talked about, or maybe that we haven't talked about um, in terms of, you know, collecting data or analyzing data or, you know, setting up, you know, pivot table, regression analysis, whatever the case may be, that would help owners, current owners of laundromats. What do you think you would suggest owners start with? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I would think I think the thing I've gotten probably the most mileage out of um, is probably um, stack ranking my the the items that I want to to work on in the projects. You know, the the other stuff has been more informational at this point than mm-hmm. you know really gotten me any grand returns or anything like that. Um, but but I do feel like I've gotten um, significant improvement um, and been able to get a lot of those quick wins that we talked about from actually taking time right at the beginning um, and trying to prioritize everything that I need to get done um, because. You know, I, I probably would have just, you know, if I'm just doing it haphazardly and without any kind of structure, um, I, I don't think I would have been as uh, been able to keep the focus and been able to get as the mileage that I've gotten out of um, the the projects that I've taken uh, undertaken so far. Yeah, I love that. And and two, I just want to point out, you know, maybe your laundromats are in pretty good shape and you're not really working on them to the same degree, but you can use stack ranking for you know, acquiring your next laundromat or, you know, adding new services to your laundromat. You can use it for all kinds of things um, in your business. So I love that, that tip for uh, tip for owners to use stack ranking. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have another little section called pro tips. Pro tips. And that's for people buying their first laundromat. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah. Now I always hear that uh, thing. Is that your daughter that does the the pro tips? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. It cracks me up. Um, yeah. um, so uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you're, if you're buying a laundromat, I mean, I think just being, being aware of what you're, you know, what you're getting into, um, you know, have, you know, having an entrepreneurial spirit and having a passion for business in general is, is I think pretty important. If you're just wanting to go in and make a quick buck, I mean, it, you very well can do it. And, um, but I think, you know, whatever the time commitment you think is going to be, it, you know, go ahead and double it. You know, it, it is going to take, <laughs> take, take, you know, a lot of your time and, you know, be okay with the worst case scenario. Um, and a lot of situations because that, that may very well be what you get. Um, you know, I don't think I got the worst case scenario, but it, it was not the, uh, certainly was not the best case scenario. Um, but you know, I, I was, I went into it with the thought that, Hey, like if this doesn't go perfectly, like, you know, we're going to be okay. Like this is, this is something I, you know, I'm okay with just even a, at a break even or a slight loss. Um, I feel comfortable with my ability to, um, you know, build the business and, you know, take some time to get it up to speed. Yeah. I love that. And I like the, um, I like the, the advice of be okay with the worst case scenario initially. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Cause I mean, like you said, you need to, you need to have a plan of, okay, if it is worst case scenario, I always recommend my, my coaching clients, right? If it, if it's worst case scenario, let's have a plan in place of how you're going to improve it. Like, how are we going to get more customers there? How are we going to provide more value to our customers? Um, and, uh, yeah. So, you know, initially being okay with, okay, things are, you know, not what I was hoping. So how am I going to move forward from here? Um, is I think that's great advice. Mm-hmm. I would say don't be okay long term with the worst case yeah, scenario. Correct. And that's a mistake I made uh when in my first one, I got kind of punched in the gut, it was worse than my worst case scenario. <laughs> and literally, and I think I was just so stunned I didn't know uh, like what to do from there, right? And so 
being prepared, like, okay, if it is worst case scenario, what actions am I going to take? Uh, because it's like, was it Mike Tyson? Everybody has a plan to you get yeah. punched, right? Like, punched in the face. Yeah. I got, I got punched <laughs> in the face and I did not know, uh, what to do for yeah. way too long. Right. And so I didn't take any action. Uh, we have another section, uh, called recommended resources. And I didn't prep you for this. So if you don't have any resources, that's okay. We, you know, we're going to link uh, tutorials on some of the stuff we talked about, the pivot tables, regression analysis, that kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. any other resources you'd recommend either to develop personally um, or to develop uh, business wise, it could be a book or anything else. Yeah. I mean, you know, you don't really need much outside the laundromat resource. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, right, man. but if you're, if you're, if you, decide you wanna, <laughs> if you decide you want to venture out a little bit, um, you know, actually, you know, one thing, um, one book I read when I was, you know, kind of in my tour duty and customer service was, uh, you know, a complaint is a gift. Um, I don't know if you need to read the whole book, but, you know, maybe browse it like, you know, to, to t- understand, like take customer feedback and complaints as, as, you know, these nuggets of, uh, useful nuggets that you can use to improve your business. They're basically telling you how to run your business. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it kind of tells you how to, how to reframe that, um, that thought process on, on customer feedback and use it more effectively. Um, then for people who are, you know, in the you know search process or maybe are um, looking at expanding, buying the more laundromats, um, meridianecon.com is something that I've used. Um, and it's a free demographics tool that you can go in and you can specify a few different areas. Um, and then like the radius you want to do around those areas. And it will give you a breakdown of the demographics in the area. How many are renters? How many are owners? How are like, it's, and it's free, which is the mm-hmm. best part of it. So um, mm-hmm. I see a, a lot of stuff is, you know, it, you got to pay to pay to use it. And this one's, um, I'm sure they're going to make you charge you eventually if you keep, you know, use it, but at least, uh, for some initial, um, research, it's, it's a good tool. Yeah. That's an awesome, awesome tool. And, you know, just as fair warning to everybody, the further you venture from laundromat resource, the thinner the ice gets. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Well, William, this has been awesome. I, like I said, I was blown away when you sent me that email after uh, episode, I think 55, I'll link to it in case you haven't listened to it yet. Um, it's just kind of my rant on, where the industry is going and why I think we need to be, you know, aware of it and maybe, you know, starting to move that direction ourselves, at least in, in some capacity. So, um, but man, this has been awesome. I love, love, love you, just your story about getting into the laundromat, uh, your first laundromat and how you did it kind of in the middle of getting married, which is, man, that's gotta be you know, so stressful. <laughs> Those are like two pretty big life events all happening yep. at once. Yeah. yeah. And we bought a new house in January. So just to, oh, just to yeah. add that just on there. To, just to throw it on top. <laughs> yeah, man. Speaking of which, man, the housing market has been insane right now. Yeah. Especially so, in Phoenix. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's pretty crazy. Dude, crazy. Uh, so yeah, but love that story. And then also just love the insight that you brought in terms of, you know, data gathering and data analysis and, how we can kind of practically do that as, um, as laundromat owners, you know, and that's maybe something that hasn't crossed many of our minds, uh, up to this point. And so, and just kind of a new area to geek out on in terms of our business is, you know, how to collect this data and, and what to do with it once we've collected it, how to, how do we, you know, organize it in a way to help us make good decisions for our businesses. So dude, appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on and, uh, and sharing all your, your insight and your wisdom. And we're going to have to have you back on to hear your update as you, I mean, you're early in your process. You just started mm-hmm. collecting data and really haven't had a chance to make any decisions based off of it because you don't have enough of it yet. So I'd love to have you back on at some point and hear how this data has affected your business. It'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I appreciate you having me on. It's been great. Yeah. It's been an honor, man. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Sounds good. All right. I don't know about you, but I was taking notes during this episode. It was incredible, incredible, huge thanks to William for sharing so much of his experience and also so much of his wisdom. He has a, he's coming from a unique perspective that a lot of us, you know, aren't, 
aren't coming from. We're not coming from, uh, you know, an analyst perspective on the industry. And so having his perspective, having him point us in the direction of some tools that can help us better collect and analyze data is invaluable in my opinion. And hopefully you're able to check out some of the tutorials that we link to and um, put some of this into practice and improve your businesses because of it, not just so that you uh, you know become more profitable, which we hope that you will be. And I think that you will be, uh, but also so that you can provide more value to your customers um, and build your brand and yeah, just, I mean, good things galore, good things galore. So, all right, guys. Well, my one big takeaway, I always say, pick one thing that you're going to put into practice uh, from this episode. There's a lot of different things that you could put into practice. And if you try to tackle all of them at once and you're unfamiliar with some of the stuff he was talking about, uh, it could be overwhelming. So pick one right? Pick one thing, you know, maybe it's stack ranking. That was the secret sauce, right? Pick stack ranking and try it out. See how it works. Try some cluster analysis, some pivot tables, whatever the case may be, pick something and get cracking on it, right? Because it's action that paves our way to success. So make sure you're taking action on something. My big takeaway, my big action step, you know, I mean, if he's going to say that the secret sauce for uh, current laundromat owners to propel you to the next level in your business is going to be stack ranking. I'm going to try stack ranking. So that is going to be my big takeaway for this week. I'm going to try stack ranking. I got some improvements. I got some new equipment coming into one of my laundromats. So I want to make some uh, just improvements around that and utilize that event of new equipment coming in to best kind of leverage getting some new customers and uh, you know, just increasing my value in the community. So I'm gonna use stack ranking for that, put it into action, and hopefully that will help get me prioritized in the right direction and get going. So thank you, William, for that. Let me know what you're gonna be doing, what action step you're gonna take uh, on the forums, laundromatresource.com slash forums, head to the laundromat forum and tell me, Tell, tell everybody, tell each other. You don't even have to tell me, uh, tell each other uh, what action you're going to be taking because, you know, when we put it out there, it's a lot harder to skimp on that and not do something, shirk it, uh, whatever, whatever the right word for that is. Uh, once you put it out there and you let other people know. So put it out there, let other people know what action you're going to take and then go take that action. All right, guys, we will see you next week. Incredible, incredible guests next week. I'm super excited about it. Um, we've already done the interview. It is amazing and you're going to love it. Ton of value coming next week as always. All right.